Good evening. I'm Newell Williams, president of Bright Divinity School. It is my privilege uh, to welcome you to this 23rd annual Gates of High Lecture in Contemporary Judaism. This lecture, now in its 23rd uh, annual uh, year, um, this lecture uh, is, is in memory of Larry Kornbleet and members of the family of Stanley and Marcia Kornbleet Kurtz who perished in the Holocaust. Thus, it seems appropriate to note that it has been less than a week since we learned of heroic, no, horrific, horrific violence that targeted Asian women. Let us then begin with a moment of silence to remember those who died Pray for all of those who have suffered loss of any sort because of these and other vicious assaults upon Asian and Asian American people. And to pray that people of every race and culture will commit to actions that bring to an end such acts of violence. Will you join me? The word high means life. In these lectures in contemporary Judaism, we enter the gates of life. Dr. Ariel Feldman, the Rosalind and Manny Rosenthal Associate Professor of Judaic Studies and Director of the Jewish Studies Program will introduce this year's distinguished speaker. Thank you, Professor Williams. Dear friends, it is my pleasure to welcome to Bright a very distinguished guest tonight, Professor David Aaron, an ordained rabbi. Professor Aaron teaches Hebrew Bible and history of interpretation at the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, the flagship institution of the reform movement in the US and worldwide, and also co-directs the Hebrew Union College Press. Professor Aaron published extensively on the Hebrew Bible with a book on the history of the Ten Commandments, another book on the biblical metaphors, and yet another one on the interpretation of Genesis. There is, however, much more than, than that that Professor Aaron is writing on, including a book on the French philosopher Denis Diderot, an opera libretto, and a novel on the essence of piety. Tonight, Professor Aaron will speak to us on coming to terms with the ethics of our ancestors. As we listen to him, Please feel free to send in your questions. We'll try to collect them and then present some of them. We probably won't have time for all of them to our distinguished guest. Professor Aaron, the Zoom stage is all yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, Professor Feldman. And uh, thank you, President Williams, for your warm welcome. And I'm honored to be part of the um, Gates of Chai lecture and my uh, it's a deep honor to be speaking at uh, Bright Divinity. I'm going to now share my screen, which is uh, the way we live these days, where we aren't present, but we share ourselves on a flat screen. I hope now you can see that. And I assume if you cannot, that um, Clayton will let me know. Okay, so the, my talk this evening is called Coming to Terms with the Ethics of Our Ancestors. And there is a pun uh, embedded in this title. Uh, the pun stems from the fact that uh, there is a book, a third century book called Mishnah Avot. And that book, that tractate, which is actually part of a larger work called the Mishnah, or if you wish, the Talmud, uh, has various uh, translations, and sometimes it's called the chapters of the fathers. To update that concept of fathers, it could be the chapters of the ancestors, and frequently 
this tractate is called The Ethics of the Fathers. This is the only tractate of the Mishnah, as indicated, uh, generally dated to the year 220. It is the only tractate of the Mishnah which is printed, published separately from the other tractates of the Mishnah. And it is generally classified as a work of wisdom literature. Now, I'm going to deal with a number of questions this evening. And I want to differentiate right from the beginning what we are going to be doing this evening from what is commonly uh, done in other contexts of historiography. So you all know that there are raging debates about whether certain schools should be named after individuals whose, it turns out, whose ethics uh, are questionable, or whether uh, Civil War figures should be memorialized in statues, or slave owners should be uh, able to lend their names to various institutions. And this is a, a serious debate and one that we should be having in the United States. But this evening, I'm going to actually be drawing attention to a series of questions that are very specific to religion. And though my specialty is Hebrew Bible and rabbinic literature, uh, the questions that I'm going to be posing could apply to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, or Hinduism, or any other religion. Uh, of the world, and I will try to show how those questions actually can be adapted, and I'm going to look at various traditions in the time that we have allotted to us. So let's, let's establish what the main questions are. As historians of ideas, how should we relate to the ethical positions of earlier times? Now, what does that mean? That means if you are dealing with a canonical or a quasi-canonical text, and what would those be? They would be the Hebrew Bible or Christian scriptures or church fathers or the Mishnah or the Talmud or Quran or Hadith or prominent works of medieval or early modern theologians. If you are dealing with these works and they contain ethical positions that we today would find offensive, unpalatable, things that we could not possibly live with, that they espouse beliefs or even social polities that we consider immoral. How should we understand their positions? How should we teach this literature? Now, this is obviously a very pressing issue for anyone who teaches at a divinity school, as I do. And we constantly are confronting texts from antiquity all the way through early modern times and into modern times that present a variety of ethical conundrums. And that question really came to the fore as I was writing the, the book that I've just finished on Mishnah Avot. And that book is called Subversive Principles Toward an Ethics for Reading Avot. And I became consumed by this question of what do I do with the book that is part of the canon, that is taught regularly, that is read regularly. What do I do about the fact that these various passages cherished by so many people actually are intolerable, morally speaking? So what could possibly be intolerable? Well, let's look at some of our favorite social and ideological immoralities. We'll just come up with a few. Misogyny. Well, misogyny is one of the favorite, favorite uh, unethical behaviors throughout history. And in fact, my talk is going to focus on misogyny. But let's not, um, let's, we have to mention at least a few others since antiquity right until the modern world the Western religions have had to deal with the issue of slavery. There has been racism since great antiquity. And there is, of course, our favorite religious persecution, which involves for Jews anti-Semitism. But within Christianity, there is an extremely long tradition of persecuting so-called heretics. So between misogyny, slavery, racism, religious persecution, all of these 
attitudes or these social behaviors are prominent within Jewish literature of antiquity, within Christian literature of antiquity, within Islam of antiquity. And the question is, how are we to teach these texts? What is our ethical responsibility with regard to these types of documents? So when I began researching this subject, I found hundreds, that's not an exaggeration, hundreds of examples that do the exact same thing over and over again. This is what I'm going to give you that I just happened to come up upon very recently. This is a picture of Melanchthon, Philip Melanchthon, who is generally thought to be second only to Martin Luther as a theologian of the Reformation and second only to Erasmus of Rotterdam as a humanist and scholar. And in this particular book that I was reading, on the Reformation, I came upon the following statement. Melanchthon's anti-Jewish attitude reflected the mores of his age. That is the dominant way of seeing this. And this, by the way, is in an outstanding book and a chapter in that book by Timothy Wengert, who is a first-rate scholar of the Reformation. But the, the attitude that, okay, Yes, the person was a misogynist. Yes, the person was an anti-Semite. Yes, the person was a racist. But everybody at that time did that. We, ha we find throughout the literature that we can have a person we hold in high esteem who was a great thinker, who wrote marvelous literature, but in fact they were racist or misogynist or they persecuted people of different faiths. And we sort of move on, we pass that over, saying, well, their attitudes reflected the mores of their age. Well, I began investigating that. And I found that, in fact, it's simply a strange way of relating to history. Because for every person that we say they were just sort of typical of their age, we find that there were other utterly extraordinary individuals who did quite the opposite of what other people of their age were doing. And we're going to talk about what that might mean for us as historians or as theologians. But I want to give one of my favorite examples, and that is Christine of Pizan. Perhaps many of you are familiar with her. Christine was married at 15. She was born in Venice. Her father moved to France as a member of the court in France. And remarkably, her father educated her as a humanist with the same form of education any of the contemporary males would have received. She was married at 15, given off in an arranged marriage, bore, bore three children, and she was widowed at 25. And generally, we think of Christine of Pizan as the very first person to make a living from writing in France. She um, died, actually, it's not clear whether it was 1430, sometimes you'll see 1431. She made a living with her books. She wrote a very broad uh, variety of, in a very broad variety of genres. She wrote poetry, including love poetry. She even wrote a military treatise. She wrote all sorts of uh, books about contemporary politics. She was familiar with the court of France and the um, queen of France. And she uh, wrote a very particular book, which we're going to look at just an excerpt from in a moment. But this is a picture of Christine presenting her moral proverbs. I could spend two hours just commenting on this illuminated pic, this uh, illumination, this picture. It, it is an amazing picture. I want you to know that this is from Christine's own book, um, the Book of the City of Ladies, which is published in 1405. Christine wrote the book and then oversaw all of the illustrations 
And the illustrations were done by women illustrators, quite remarkable for the very beginning of the 15th century. Uh, Christine is not the first highly literate woman to write. We, of course, many of us know of Hildegard von Bingen, who, who dies at the uh, he dies around 1170, but, but she is the first to actually make a living as an author, to the best of our knowledge. Here we have her de depicted sitting on a cathedra, which is supposed to, excuse the typo, that's supposed to be an O. And, and by the way, if you find more typos, please do let me know. And you pay me a quarter for every typo you find. Think about it. Anyway, here the bishop's chair, she's sitting in the bishop's chair associated with the ecclesiastical learning and authority. Um, some related to the scene as typical of a medieval disputation common in universities where women, of course, were not permitted to study. But she is depicting herself in front of especially the man in the middle as a cleric, depicting herself teaching them about morality. Very important symbolism of her dress and headdress, but I won't have time to go through all of those elements. But I want to read here the very beginning of this remarkable book, The Book of the City of Ladies. Uh, and and this, is, this is how it begins. One day I was sitting alone in my study, surrounded by books of, uh, of all kinds of, on all kinds of subjects, devoting myself to literary studies and usual habit. What a fabulous statement. She is making it clear that she is a scholar. This is how she lives, surrounded by books. She reads those books. And she says that my, my, my mind dwelt at length on the weighty opinions of various authors whom I had studied for a long time. I looked up from my book, having decided to leave such subtle questions in peace and to relax by reading some small book. By chance, a strange volume came into my hands not one of my own, but one which had been given to me along with some others. When I held it open and saw its title page that it was by Matteolus, I smiled, for though I had never seen it before, I had often heard of it. It discussed respect for women. Now, of course, this is highly sarcastic. The war this actual book by Matteo of Bologna is called The Lamentations of Matteolus. It's 1295, that's its publication date. And um, uh, Christine would have had access to a French translation by Jean Lefebvre, of, uh, published around 1371, 1372. So she's now writing about 30 years, 33 years, if you will, after um, the French translation appeared. Of course, she could have read it in Latin, but she indicates that she is actually reading the French version. So, um, it says that it discussed respect from women, but actually it's the absolute opposite. It is a hideous, vitriolic condemnation of women. It is so vulgar and so violent against women, it's, it's utterly astounding. Anyway, she continues. I thought I would browse through it to amuse myself. I had not been reading for very long when my good mother called me to refresh myself with some supper, for it was evening. Don't you love that? She's sitting there reading and mom calls, Christine, it's time for dinner, and she puts her book down. So the realism here is very important because it shows something of not only her sense of humor, but her sense of awareness of what is taking place as she very self-consciously is reading this misogynistic book. The next morning, again seated at my study, as was my habit, I remembered wanting to examine this book by Matteolus. I started to read it and went on for a little while. Because the subject seemed to me not very pleasant for people who do not enjoy lies and of no use in developing virtue or manners, given its lack of integrity and diction and theme. And after browsing here and there and reading the end, I put it down in order to turn my attention to more elevated and useful study. But just the sight of this book, even though it was no, of no authority, made me wonder how it happened that so many different men and learned men among them have been and are so inclined to express both in speaking and in their treatises and writings so many wicked insults about women and their behavior. So Christine is fully aware 
of the evil of misogyny and its institutionalization. 1405. She then goes on to create this marvelous allegory in which there are three women speaking with her. I'll show you in this picture the three women who are in the house to the right in the middle of the screen are reason, rectitude, and justice. Over on the left, the picture on the left, is Christine presenting her book of the City of Ladies to the Queen of France, who is Isabeau of Bavaria. And way to the right of the screen, you will see that she depicts the City of Ladies being built by women. All of these images are engineered, are devised by Christine. So back to the previous slide. She begins to speak to the three, uh, the three, these three ladies, reason, rectitude, and justice. She begins to speak to them, and for each one she speculates as to why misogyny is so prominent in society. And she, Lady Reason, this is now in paragraph 7, explains that some men who blame women do it with good intentions, though good intentions are no excuse for error. Others blame them because of their own vices, others because of the infirmity of their own bodies, others of by pure jealousy, others still because they like to slander. In effect, what we see here is um, she goes through Christine goes through a variety of reasons in the name of Lady Reason for why men are misogynistic. Now, you might say that there's quite a difference between identifying the men who are misogynistic and the woman who recognizes that how misogyny functions within her society. But I would suggest that it is just as remarkable and powerful to note that a woman, a scholarly woman, writing at the very beginning of the 15th century would produce an entire book condemning misogyny. Now, lest you think she is a modern feminist, be cautious. She does not in this book, um, she does not uh, endorse universal women's education. So there are many things that uh, it would take Mary Wollstonecraft before we would recognize that women had to be educated in the exact same manner of men. But uh, nonetheless, it is still a remarkable book with tremendous insight into the uh, situation, the social situation in her own day. And that phrase about how is it possible for such intelligent men to be so stupid, so foolish, is at the center of that opening chapter in the City of the Ladies. Now, let's go back for just a moment since we put these favorite, favorite immoralities uh, on screen and maybe move through them too quickly. Misogyny, slavery, racism, and religious persecution. We find these not just in every era of human history, but we find these advocated in religious texts. And Professor Birgit Zauer of the University of Vienna writes, the strong link between racism, antisemitism, misogyny, and sexism are also underestimated. What is overlooked is that men often radicalize themselves simultaneously as racists and anti-Semites, as well as sexists, misogynists, and self-proclaimed anti-genderists. Historically, such structures of exclusion and rejection have been closely linked since the 19th century. Well, Professor Zauer is a historian of the modern world. I would suggest that actually we could extend this backward quite a bit. I would suggest that these various maladies of civilization have been linked for quite some time, and there is a very narrow, if any, line between misogyny, racism, and other forms of bigotry that populate antiquity as much as it does more contemporary times. So 
If that's true, and I'm dealing with the question of how to deal with an ancient text, shouldn't we ask, is there progress? And I would like to suggest that we have to move to understand histor history as a non-linear process. We cannot ask the question of, is there progress? Even though this, of course, is a big industry now. Steven Pinker has written two recent books on how could we possibly think there hasn't been pro uh, progress. Just having antibiotics or a vaccine shows tremendous progress. If, and he asks a question like, would you rather be alive in 1620 or 1621 or 2021? And certainly everyone would say, well, yes, there's a greater chance of reaching old age in 2021. The problem is that the question of what is progress has to relate to something specific. It can't be generally does the entire society show progress because what we see historically is that at any given moment we may feel overwhelmed by the positivity, positivity of progress, but political circumstances are highly unstable. If you would ask whether there was progress after the First World War, you would say, yes, that was the war to end all wars. But if you were alive in 1941, you might have looked at it very differently. So this question of is there progress has to be targeted at specific elements in the historical process. Instead, what I'm recommending is that we have to say there may be conventions that are dominant in any given era, but no one's personal behavior takes place out of necessity. Having moral responsibility implies that we, each of us, we are thinking agents. We are accountable for our actions. So we can acknowledge that good and bad ideas, good and bad beliefs, good and bad behaviors, good and bad policies exist simultaneously at all times. So if that is true, then we have to ask ourselves, how do we choose? How does any scholar choose? Do we just do what is the convention? Do we say we behave this way because it is conventional? Or are we responsible for all of our attitudes? I would suggest that neither culture nor history constitute entities that can be thought of as morally responsible. Only individuals are responsible for their actions and attitudes. Thus, to say that you did something typical of the mores of your time, of your epoch, to say that you are personifying history, you are personifying culture, and in doing that, you are in effect exonerating the individual. Culture comes from people. It is not imposed upon people. Neither culture nor one's historical era should be used to exonerate bad behavior. Now, I know very well the argument of colonialists and imperialists. And I know very well those who are anti-colonialist and anti-imperialist. And they would take great offense at this notion that we can hold individuals responsible. And they would say, who are you to judge an era or a place or a time or a culture? And that is what led numerous philosophers to deal with the question of whether there is a universal ethic in any way meaningful. And I'd like to open this discussion by looking at a number of texts, and we're going to come back to this. But I want to start with Martin Sarr's beautifully articulated statement in this 
terrific article on genealogy and subjectivity. Genealogy is a reference to Nietzsche's concept of the genealogy of an idea or the genealogy of morals. Sahar wrote, tell me the story of the genesis and development of my self-understanding in such a way that hearing you talk I don't want to be as I thought I have to be. And that hearing you talk, I realize that this isn't necessary. Martha Nussbaum has written extensively on the issue of women's rights, justice for women throughout the world. And in this superb essay, uh, one of the chapters in Sex and Social Justice, answering those who say to her, you have no right to judge another culture, she writes the following. It is better to risk being consigned by critics to the hell reserved for alleged westernizers and imperialists, however unjustified such criticism would in fact be, than to stand around in the vestibule waiting for a time when everyone will like what we are going to say. And what we are going to say is that there are universal obligations to protect human functioning and its dignity and that the dignity of women is equal to that of men. If that involves assault on many local traditions, both Western and non-Western, so much the better, because any tradition that denies these things is unjust. So I had those ideas ringing in my head when I had to translate and write in my book on a vote, a commentary to the following passage. Yossi ben Yochanan Ish Yerushalayim Omer, Yossi ben Yochanan of Jerusalem said, let your home be generously open. Let the poor be among your household servants. Do not speak excessively with your wife. They said this regarding a man's wife, all the more so someone else's wife. On the basis of this teaching, the sages said, whenever a man speaks excessively with his wife, he causes himself harm. He nullifies words of Torah and his destiny is to inherit Gehinom. Now let me comment on some details in this passage in Mishnah Avot. First, you'll notice that I put in two parallel lines. What comes after those parallel lines appears to be an addendum. How do we know that? There is a radical stylistic shift in the Hebrew indicating a later form of Hebrew or a shift in genre. So at that point, it said, they said this regarding a man's wife. In the, he, in the Hebrew, the phrase, which I've translated as all the more so, is actually a technical term, a rhetorical term, for a kind of argument that is based on a smaller circumstance justifying a larger circumstance. I don't want to go into detail how it's used, but it's extremely popular and it is not used in Avot because Avot is not discursive. Avot is made up of aphorisms. It is not made up of arguments. Kal vachomer, this phrase, all the more so, is decidedly or specifically a rhetorical device when you're in a discourse or a discursive kind of literary passage that is making an argument about something. This is foreign to the genre of Avot 1 and chap chapters 1 and 2, 
there are some attempts at discursive argumentation in one of the later chapters, but the, the book of Avot is predominantly aphoristic. So we know from the point of those two lines that either a scribe added this next phrase or it, it came in at a later, later moment of redaction when Avot was being reworked. And it's, there are many sections of Avot that show later redaction. In fact, chapter five clearly was not part of the original book and chapter six is a medieval addendum. So the opening passage, which is I've translated as let the poor be, um, let your home be generously open. Rivacha is a difficult term. It, it sort of means wide, but it also means plentitude or in this case, I'm using the word generous. And let the, the um, poor be among your household. It could mean just poor people generally. However, given the context, and I cannot provide that context right now, it probably means in, uh, employing servants who are actually the disciples of sages. And this is a way of providing uh, work, uh, what do you call it, work scholarships, if you will, um, that you can have them as servants in your home, you give them a livelihood and that, that way they can study. That's based on the context. If taken out of context, you wouldn't have to add the word servants. And then, of course, altar besichai misha, quite direct, do not speak excessively with your wife. Now, I am interpreting this to mean excessively. The verb tarbe, some of you may be students of Hebrew. This is a hif'il, which has two, two, uh, oh, excuse me, two uh, different connotations. One is um, to implement an increase as a direct object, but it can also here be comparative or an internal process uh, there are numerous hifil verbs that uh, are almost reflexive, not fully reflexive, but for instance, to turn white or to turn green or to have something dyed red, you can use a hifil verb. And I'm saying that instead of instead of just simply do not increase um, uh, discourse or conversation uh, with uh, your wife, I am uh, interpreting this to mean excessively. It is not saying don't speak at all, but it is in, it encouraging one to speak less. Also, the, whether it is your wife or just the wife, that can also be controversial. But here, the word ha'isha has a determining article. And in this stratum of Hebrew literature, the determining article can and often does indicate in certain phrases a kind of possessive. All right, now we look at what comes after those two lines. They said this regarding a man's own wife, all the more so regarding some other woman, some other man's wife. And then we have yet a second addendum. This phrase, on the basis of this teaching, the sages said, this phrase signals that we have an addition to the core aphorism. And now we're told whenever a man speaks excessively with his wife, he is actually causing himself harm. He is nullifying words of Torah. And here Torah specifically means learning, learning. And his destiny is not to inherit light after life after death, but to be sent to Gehinom. I do not want to discuss the exact concept of Gehinom. It is not specifically hell as it would develop in Christian literature, but it is a complicated form of the afterworld where I promise you, you do not want to end up. Now, when we look at this passage, which by the way is uh, reprinted in every single edition of Avot, and it's not the only offensive passage in Avot, we uh, find that it is not alone and that there are other passages in other pieces of literature, just as old, that are uh, similar. And here I've brought a passage from the Tosefta Brachot. The Tosefta is a collection of sayings and legal materials 
Its origin is very complicated. It seems to be around the same time of the Mishnah, but its codification may be a little bit after the Mishnah. It was probably in circulation also at the end of the second and beginning of the third century. The Hebrew stylistically is somewhat different from the Mishnah. But here we read in Tosefta, so pretty much the same era, Rabbi Yehuda says a person is obligated to say three blessings daily. Blessed is God that he did not make me a Gentile. Blessed is God that he did not make me a woman. And implied, blessed is God that he did not make me a boor. Shelo asani boor. And boor is in Hebrew boor, and that's what it is in English. So these are the blessings that the Tosef de Brachot tells us we should say every single day. And lo and behold, in the traditional Hebrew prayer book, going back to the ninth century, we do have in the morning prayers the following uh, blessings. Uh, the first one is who did not make me a Gentile. The second who did not make me a slave. And instead of a boor, which may be simply uh, almost a synonym. And then finally, who did not make me a woman. So we see that this misogynistic attitude, and I know there are all sorts of apologetic approaches, especially in contemporary literature, which says, oh no, you're misinterpreting. This is not insulting at all. This was meant to say exactly what it says. You were to be grateful you were not a woman, you were not a slave or a boor, and you were not a Gentile. And uh, I don't think it takes uh, a lot to understand what is being said here. Now, we could say with most scholars that this is simply typical of the era. And in fact, we can show that the rabbis weren't even very inventive because in Diogenes Laertius, we have a passage in the lives of the eminent philosophers, the following. Hermippus in his lives ascribes to Thales the story which is told by some about Socrates, namely that he used to say, there were three blessings for which he was grateful for fortune, to fortune. First, that I was born a human being and not one of the brutes. Next, that I was born a man and not a woman. Thirdly, a Greek and not a barbarian. So here we have in Greek literature the exact same, more or less, blessing that the rabbis would adopt. So they weren't even original in their misogyny. And so it would not be unreasonable, I suppose, no, it is unreasonable, but it is not uncommon for a historian to say, look, the rabbis were emulating the dominant culture of their time. There's nothing different here. Until we begin to dig a little bit deeper and realize that actually at the exact same time, that those Greeks were writing those nasty blessings and those rabbis were adopting them for their daily practice, there were others who were condemnatory of the mistreatment of women and slaves and the ignorant. And one of the most renowned was Epicurus. And I'm going to show you um, how Epicurus not only was against uh, what was being said, but I'm going to show you in voices that are contemporaneous with the rabbis and early Christian writers who adopted these attitudes, because Epicurus, while he lives in, you know, almost uh, 600 years, a little more than 600 years before the Mishnah, Epicurus ends up becoming the paradigm of the philosophy later Greeks, Jews, and Christians disdain. And actually the depictions of Epicurean thought are all distortions of what Epicurean thought was, but that's perfect because in distorting it, they tell us what they think it was about. And in this case, it offers us this fantastic counterexample. And here we have the marvelous lack Tantius, who wrote in these divine institutes, uh, by the way, Lactantius was um, converted to Christianity. He wrote a series of 
um, apologetic documents uh, defending uh, Christianity against Hellenistic philosophers, and he was an advisor to Constantine the First. Until many ages afterwards, the crazy Epicurus lived, who alone ventured to deny that which is most evident, doubtless through the desire of discovering novelties that he might found a sect in his own name. So basically he's saying that Epicurus was a nutcake, and the only reason he said what he said was because he wanted to get people to follow him. The system of Epicurus was much more generally followed than those of the other nutcakes, he means to say, not because it brings forward any truth, oh my goodness, that no one would ascribe to Epicurus, but because the attractive name of pleasure invites many, for everyone is naturally inclined to vices. So this is what is most associated with Epicureanism, hedonism, pleasure. But of course, it's a complete distortion. If you read Epicurus, the few writings we have of him, or if you read Lucretius's writings, on nature, which is the most extensive writing uh, on Epicurus, or if you read Lucian, who also had great uh, affinity f toward the Epicurean lifestyle, we learn that it is not a pleasure which they prescribe, but rather a very meticulous balance in life, so that life is without suffering. In any event, Epicurus says that the gods take no notice, that they are not affected with anger nor kind feeling, that the punishment of the future state is not to be dreaded because souls die after death, and that there is no future state of punishment at all, that pleasure is the greatest good, that there is no society among men, that everyone consults for his own interest, that there is no one who loves another unless it be for his own sake, and on and on and on we go with the distortions of Epicurus, but what I'm most interested here is that in distorting Epicurus, Lactantius also tells us that they did entertain women as potential scholars. And of course, he thinks that's absurd, but it's an obvious um, indication that someone was aware of how horrific the misogyny was of his own day. But if the nature of man is capable of wisdom, it was befitting that both workmen and countrymen and women and all, in short, who bear the human form should be taught to be wise and that the people should be brought together from every language and condition and sex and age. Therefore, it is a very strong argument that philosophy neither tends to wisdom nor is of wi itself wisdom, that its mystery is only made known by the beard and the cloak of the philosophers. The Stoics moreover perceived this, who said that philosophy was to be studied both by slaves and women. Epicurus also, who invites those who are altogether unacquainted with letters to philosophy. So Epicurus not only invited slaves and women, but even men who were illiterate, which was not true of other philosophical schools. And finally, Lactantius makes very clear his misogyny. Geometry, he's talking about what could be studied. Geometry also and music and astronomy are necessary because these arts have some connection with philosophy. And the whole of these subjects cannot be learned by women, nor by slaves, nor by the poor, or laborers or rustics. And on this account, Tully says that philosophy is a verse from the multitude. But Epicurus, Epicurus, he will receive the ignorant. And passage goes on indicating he will receive the ignorant, he will receive women, he will receive slaves, he will receive the poor he will receive anyone. In fact, Epicurus was said to do his philosophizing outside and it came to be known, groups of Epicureans who gathered to discuss philosophy came to be known as the garden. The place of their study was the garden. And we do have numerous other passages which I could bring this evening and which are in, in my forthcoming book that show that, yes, women participated in philosophical discourse at a very high level. I am not bringing uh, today a fabulous, what we think is an authentic letter of Epicurus to his mother, 
that he wrote a dis when he had to leave, he went on a long trip and he wrote this very long letter dealing with all sorts of philosophical issues to his mother, suggesting not only that his mother was literate, that she could receive the letter. Some have argued, no, someone would have read it to her, but there is no reason to deny that she might have been, that she would have been literate. He writes to her as if she is going to read it, but the discussion involves and demonstrates knowledge of philosophical issues. And he does not hesitate to send that home to mom. And that is an extremely important document, which we do not have time to uh, look at. However, um, uh, before we leave this and begin to summarize, I, I have to point out that in the Tractate of Vote, we do have a fabulous anti-Epicurean statement Rabbi Elazar says, be diligent in your study of Torah and know how to refute an Epicurean. The Epicurean represented just a terribly anti-establishment worldview to many of these writers because they accepted women, because you did not have to be of a particular social stratum in order to enter their discourse within the garden. And they denied life after death. They denied that the gods respond to human prayer and they were just a, you know, an overall pain to everyone who had a theology within Judaism and Christianity that did not wish to consider what Lucretius would end up uh, providing them uh, as the greatest expositor of uh, Epicurus uh, just before the writing of the Mishnah. So the rabbis, the only Greek philosophy, the only Greek philosophy identified in the book of Avot is that of Epicurus. And here we read, know how to refute them. Now, before we leave this, I do have to show you that even, even a scholar on Epicurus writes, the garden included household servants and women on equal terms with men, which was completely out of line with the social norms of the time. But Epicurus believed that humble people and women could understand and benefit from his philosophy as well as educated men. You know, the problem is that the winners get to write history and the documents we have from antiquity are highly, highly selective. I know that um, Professor Feldman teaches Dead Sea Scrolls, presently teaching Dead Sea Scrolls. Imagine prior to the 1940s, we had no idea that the Dead Sea Scrolls existed. Ironically, one document that, that Solomon Schechter found in the Cairo Geniza in the 1890s turns out to be a document that also is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But that document existed, it's, I think if I remember correctly, it's an 11th or 12th century manuscript. That document went from the time of the Second Temple period or late Second Temple period all the way uh, to get buried in the Geniza and was unknown to us until 1898. And then by chance, it gets found in 1898. And then by chance, uh, uh, the, another version of this document is found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, we have such a narrow sense of what was written, what was believed, how people behaved, because the winners get to write history and the winners pretty much destroy what literature would have been available at any given moment. So was it completely out of line with the social norms of the time? I am not sure. So what conclusion should we draw? There were misogynists, racists, bigots, and enthusiastic traders and owners of slaves in antiquity. There are misogynists, racists, bigots, and those engaged in human trafficking today. How we relate to the literature of the past, I believe, tells us about our ethics today. An immoral action is no less immoral just because it is commonplace. People exonerate those who lived before them by ascribing their actions to the conventions of their day. They do this with the hope that future generations will judge them similarly. 
according to the same misguided historiographic practice. I offer these four points for you to consider, to debate, to mull over. But I think the attitude, the attempt to exonerate people in the past as if it's okay, they were just like everyone else, I think that's a misguided way to look at history. And as students of religion, I think we need to look at our own texts and begin evaluating how we will teach them in the future. I want to end with two quotes and then a paraphrase of a great scholar. This is Theodore Adorno. And he, in these lectures that he gave in 1964 and 1965, I believe these were lectures were given in Vienna. He talked about the question of whether there is progress. He wrote as follows. I believe that you should start by taking progress to mean this very simple thing. That it would be better if people had no cause to fear. If there were no impending catastrophe on the horizon. If you do this, it will not provide a timeless, absolute definition of progress. But it will give the idea a concrete form. For progress today really does mean simply the prevention and avoidance of total catastrophe. Now Adorno wrote those words after returning to Germany to live. He had been in Germany during the Nazi era. He fled. He lived in the United States both on the East Coast and then the West Coast. And remarkably, he and his very close friend, um, Horkheimer, they both moved back to Germany. And they began to deal with what the meaning of this catastrophic war was. And they focused a great deal on the rise of nuclear weapons but they never lost sight of the common immoralities of a society. And instead of saying that we have moral progress, Adorno had a very specific way of looking at this issue. Um, I want to end with just two more quotes. This is actually a paraphrase, which reflects very much what Saar uh, the quote I read from Saar earlier, and this is from Amy Allen's marvelous book called The End of Progress. I'm quoting, I'm paraphrasing here, a long section. By allowing us to reflect, reflexively critique the social institutions and practices, the patterns of cultural meaning and social conventions, all of the normative commitments that have made us who we are, right? Only through such critique is there any hope of freeing ourselves from the delusions that permit us to act unkindly, thoughtlessly, unjustly. Without a sustained commitment to reflexive critique, we guarantee the collision with catastrophe for someone, somewhere, at every given moment, just as Adorno prophesied. Foucault was deeply concerned with these issues of violence and power and immorality at the level of the individual and also at the level of history. And I'd like to end with his sentiment, which has in typical fashion for Foucault, marvelous multiple entendres. This is what he wrote in uh, an article on the genealogy of ethics. And notice again, just as Saar had used the word genealogy, he is commenting on, on uh, Nietzsche in this article as well. But it's in the volume called Ethics, Subjectivity and Truth. My point is 
that everything is bad. No, excuse me. My point is not that everything is bad, but that everything is dangerous, which is not exactly the same as bad. If everything is dangerous, then we always have something to do. I'd like to um, leave you with that sentiment. It is a way of thinking about our engagement with historiography. It is a way of thinking about contemporary issues. Obviously, it's not limited to questions of misogyny, racism, uh, religious persecution. But Foucault understand that if we at least take this attitude, that there is always something to be done, that we cannot just behave on the basis of the conventions of our time, perhaps in the most rare instances, we might just actually make progress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Aaron. It was such a pleasure to listen to you. I could go much longer if we just could. You, you told me 50 minutes. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I take the responsibility for that. But we do have a few questions for you, which I think can engage us all a little bit longer. So one question comes to you in a slightly longer formulation, so please excuse me for reading this. On one hand, you suggest that it isn't really appropriate to overlook unethical attitudes and historical writers simply based on conventions of era. Right? But on the other hand, you allow that one of the women you look at who ex exposed misogyny, that she herself was guilty of denying education to many women. So it wouldn't be more reasonable to allow that every person is individually unethical, but that they may have it in them, a new ethical insight that can lift us all for the future. In other words, sift out the truth, but don't allow the falsehood around it to nullify. Well, first of all, I, I pointed out, I, I didn't have to point out that she, in fact, is not very much of a feminist when it comes to women's education. I wanted to make that point very clear, and I would never think to exonerate uh, Christine from her uh, perspective. Um, to, to say that we're all unethical, I mean, if that's useful, um, that's then you can take that attitude. I would rather say that uh, we're all... Um, we're all uh, creatures in a certain kind of progress, uh, uh, excuse me, a certain kind of process, which is moving and hoping for progress. We are creatures that are always engaged in a process. We are becoming. We all have contradictions within us. Uh, this thesis is not meant to say anybody achieves perfection. It is meant to say that when there are blatant immoralities, we should just indicate that they are there and not try to excuse them, not say, oh, it was OK, that was normal for that time. So in the case of Christine of Pizan, I would say it's unfortunate. I mean, it, as I mentioned, um, Mary Wollstonecraft, she would write a book saying we must educate all women and half the problem is because women are not educated. They don't even know that they're not educated. And that was an amazing insight, by the way, that uh, Wollstonecraft is the mother of Mary Shelley, uh, of Frankenstein uh, uh, origin. So, um, uh, and she did not educate her daughter because she died. Uh, when, uh, 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 but the point here is, um, if, if you think it's useful to say we're all unethical, Okay, but I, I don't. I think we need to find a vocabulary that allows us to recognize we all have contradictions within us, but we don't try to exonerate ourselves. And when those contradictions are pointed out, we should own them and try to repair them. And I think that's the beautiful element of that quote by Saar, the notion of, okay, let's talk, you just tell me, and then maybe I'll begin to feel that the way I am is not necessary. And that, that, I think, offers us a lot. That's a transformation of attitude. Thank you very much, Professor Aaron. Next question comes in relation to your discussion of Tosefta, I believe. That's a good question. With so many redactions with scriptural antiquity, 
how and what does the pastor, minister, I should add rabbi, preach? Yeah, that's a real, I, I know that um, we, we had, uh, we had a professor at HUC some years ago, and respected greatly, who taught uh, homiletics. And he argued you shouldn't preach against the text. And I thought that that was a little bit narrow. I, uh, I don't know if the writings of Christer Stendhal are familiar to students of Bright Divinity School, but uh, Christer Stendhal was a Lutheran um, actually, he was, I believe, the Bishop of Sweden uh, prior to coming to the United States and teaching at Harvard. And um, I got to know him quite well when I was teaching at Wellesley College many years ago. And uh, Stendhal, incidentally, wrote a, a pivotal paper in, I believe it was 1957, but it might have been 59. I'm, I don't recall exactly. He is the first person to call for women's ordination in uh, the Lutheran Church in Sweden. And um, I brought uh, Stendhal to Wellesley College when I was teaching there, and we decided upon a series of questions. And the question that he insisted as a theologian on addressing was, how can I teach the anti-Semitic passages in the New Testament? What do I do with these? And there was a, quite a debate because there's a very large religion department at Wellesley College. And there was actually a member of the religion department who said, why shouldn't we redact the text, clean it up? Because after all, the text we have is redacted. And he was against that. And he argued that the way to deal with misogyny or racism or anti-religious attitudes in any classical literature is to make them very clear, not shy away from them, not give an excuse, and if you're going to preach, to use them to get us to reflect on our contemporary misogyny, racism, and anti-religious attitudes. That was his way of doing it. So in a sense, he wasn't teaching against the text, nor was he redeeming the text. And that made a tremendous impression upon me. And um, Stendhal was uh, a very profound thinker. I urge you to look at his writings. Again, his writings on women, late 1950s, early 1960s, are just tremendous. And he saw right through his time and called out the hypocrisy of his own time. So some people would avoid the passages which are uncomfortable, and others would say, let's, let's use them. And uh, let's use them as opportunities to reflect on who we are and our own era. Thank you very much for that. And there is affirmation in the chat that yes, indeed, we know who Stendhal was. So that's, that makes all of us. Uh, By the way, I don't know if you all know that Krista Stendhal always drove around in a yellow Volkswagen bug convertible. And that top was down even in the wintertime in Boston because he said, I'm a Swede and you guys don't really have winter. That's what he told me one day. Thanks very much. So this, this uh, apocryphal detail should stay on record. Yeah, very important. <laughs> I'll move to the next question. Uh, when you talked about the uh, idea of us not being made in a particular form and shape. Here's the question. That section on the praises to God for not making me a Gentile or a woman, that sounds like a caste system. Uh, we know that caste system is a phenomenon in Hindu cultures. This makes the uh, asking person wonder if there could be any Hinduist influence at all on our sources here. Um, I, I um... I don't think so, because I don't think they needed Hinduism to establish a caste system. I think that biblical religion already had a quasi-caste system in terms of its priesthood. Um, there is no question that uh, there was some exposure to Hinduism in the Babylonian Talmud, but it was through Persian, through Zoroastrianism and other Persian forms, and later uh, uh, Persian Christianity, uh, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, I don't I don't know of that. Perhaps uh, Professor Feldman might might know of that better than I. I. I'm unaware of anyone showing direct Hindu influence in terms of caste. It's not a fully formed caste. It's not the formal structure of a caste as we have in India. 
Thanks very much, Professor Aaron. And one more, I think it plays uh, back to the question uh, asked earlier on. Let me read to you the second part. So the asking person is saying that uh, I appreciate uh, the tour you've taken us on with different texts and ideas. Still, I wonder if there's any merit or some merit to considering the preponderance of literature as reflecting the mores of the time with misogyny and racism abounding, not excusing people's attitudes and actions, but helping to understand the waters in which they swam and hence their beliefs. There, there's no question that uh, there are ways of measuring the preponderance of given ideas um, in the modern world. It's extremely difficult to establish the preponderance of ideas in antiquity. I can say with certainty that the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, Christian scriptures, do not reflect the popular religion of the majority of people. If I want to know about the popular religion of the majority of people, I'm going to look to a series of fabulous archaeological finds, such as those published by Shaked Naveh, two volumes of incantation bowls. And in those incantation bowls, which include Aramaic, Greek, Hebrew, and the language of abracadabra, we see that the common person uh, in seeking to balance their lives and seeking to ward off evil in seeking to keep demons under control in seeking all sorts of things. Yes, they maybe went to their local synagogue or local church. And in fact, there is a sermon by Afrat in Syriac where he's very upset about the when when the sabbath in christianity moves to sunday he's very upset that this means that someone seeking healing could go to the synagogue on saturday and the church on sunday and it became you know you might as well hedge your bets and get the blessing wherever you could get the blessing he was very upset about that so we we note that popular religion looks very different from the texts that we have that are at a different register from what we think most people, how they thought and how they lived. So the question of what is the preponderance of an idea in antiquity, we can speculate. Certainly Greco-Roman literature sheds some light on that. But I, I think it's a very difficult issue. I do agree, however, that when for those periods where we can have some idea of what most people believe about something yes we can point that out as the dominant belief and uh, yeah, as long as we don't exonerate anybody from their responsibility for their own actions i i think that we're able to do that but with selective historical periods and very very carefully thank you for that too and uh, if everyone is agreeable to that, to keep with the framework of time, the last question for today, a little bit provocative, I would say. Given that perfect people are few and far between, what is your view on rewriting history? Do we rename the capital of the US? Um, I don't think the issue is, uh, uh, by the way, I, I wasn't aware that perfect people exist at all. So far and few between doesn't uh, that doesn't impress me. Um, I, I don't I don't think the issue is um, finding a person who's perfect. Um, I think the the issue of naming and, you know, like Princeton renamed its Woodrow Wilson School recently because the Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson turns out to have been uh, quite a um, racist and uh, bigoted human being. So why would we want to have a school educating people uh, under his name? And I, th I think Princeton in, in, in that instance did well. But I think... Um, the issue of when uh, when something should be renamed is uh, has to be considered in each and every instance and what the resonances are. And 
uh, I'm actually less concerned with renaming than I am with having the discussion. And I'm more concerned with religion having the discussion than the American polity having this discussion. I think that this theme within Judaism, Christianity, and Islam has way more profound implications than the question of who a school is named after or what is, who, who a city is named after, though I'm not saying that that shouldn't be discussed. But uh, uh, let, let's figure out ways to talk about this. And I think in each and every instance, we have a moral responsibility to decide when it's important to change a name and when it is not important. As for this Washington, uh, I, I'm not knowledgeable enough to participate in that discussion at this time, but if I had to be, I could educate myself. So really the issue is uh, to know how to carry on this discussion and to not shy away from it uh, because uh, by shying away from it or exonerating various behaviors, we're basically, as I had in one of the slides, all of the behaviors that we see in antiquity we have today. So what do we say about today? Is it okay to be a misogynist today because there are lots of misogynists? Is it okay to be racist today? Um, President Williams started with a moment of silence for the situation in Georgia. I mean, obviously he was telling us it's not okay. And I think that that we we have an obligation to make this part of religious discourse. All the 127 attendees tonight are thanking you very deeply for your lecture, for the thoughts, for Q&A. There are responses pouring in from professors and uh, friends and colleagues Thank you all for attending. Thank you for speaking so eloquently and responding so well to the questions. Friends, thank you for being here tonight. We cherish your support here at Bright. Please consider taking a look at the next event we will be organizing on April the 6th with several folks uh, local speaking on ecology in Jewish, Christian, and Muslim traditions. Please consider that, but we will not let that new event to overshadow today's success. Thank you for being with us. and. By this, I'm wishing you uh, goodbye. For those who are celebrating Passover, very soon in a couple of days, happy Passover, and the Easter is almost upon us. So best wishes from all of us here to all of you. Thank you, and hope to see you once again very soon.